Bernard comes into my little living room. Um, this is a very funny stage, isn't it? With a carpet. Uh, so good morning or good midday. And uh, this is also a very a bit of an experiment for myself. I'm an architect. Um, we, we do mostly self-developing projects in Berlin. The first project we did, we bought the site ourselves and then built a ten, uh, eight story building with 10 clients. Now we do projects with 30 clients. So, so we try to think uh, how to produce uh, diversity. And um, what, what I would like to do with this panel, I would like to talk about how do we want to live in the city. And uh, we, we, we sit together here, as in many of these conferences, and um, then we, we, we discuss the question that we want to have a better city, and everyone gets the kind of little remark, this is how to make the better city, but it's very, still doesn't really happen. At the moment, there's a lot of questions of cities. So I'm very lucky that I can discuss diversity and communication in the city with a panel that comes from very different uh, directions, because I think the only way that we can make interesting cities is that if we want to become entrepreneurs, as Kimmelman yesterday said, Michael Kimmelman, the only way we can do it is that we have to really cooperate from top down, bottom up, and we don't have this discussion as a sort of political di discussion. We have it as a tool to work. That is my, my, my experience I made with the projects. So therefore, I'm lucky because on my first panel, we will see now um, 10, uh, uh, three talks, 10 minutes long, uh, and they will give brief uh, ideas how they work with the city, how they create diversity. So the first person that will talk is uh, Teresa um, Stoko uh, Stokelova. She's a um, sociologist and an activist. She's now mainly working in the university, uh, but she's trying to make a relationship between university and reality. And I think it's very interesting to hear uh, her project about a piano project. The second person we will uh, hear today is Niombo Lomba. She's from Stuttgart. Sorry, um, Teresa is from Prague. And uh, Niombo is, um, is part of the first um, German parliament that's actually led by a green ministry, which was a bit of a revolution in Germany. Um, I thought Berlin is radical, but actually, if you want to see a radical city, you should go to Stuttgart, where you have to still broom your staircase every Saturday, but still, it seems to be more radical than Berlin. And as a um, third team, we will hear from Berlin, Juval Dietzinger and Mario Husten, they presented yesterday a project where um, they had a site right in the center of the city called Bar 25, which was like a huge event space, bars, clubs, a very active place for public uh, activities. And then, of course, the idea of gentrification made this site become very precious. And they said, why don't we become developers as well? Why do we not take over the site? And they will talk about this. And when we're done um, with these three talks, we have two more guests that will discuss uh, the questions I pose. One person is uh, Andre Grinev. He's a developer from Russia. And the interesting thing is, he just told me, they're developing a piece of land of 500 hectares. And I checked this because I wasn't sure how big it is. It means five kilometers long and one kilometer wide. I don't know if it has exactly this shape, but actually it means this is a whole city. For me, I mean, my first site was 758 square meter. Very interesting, I think. And, and, and then, of course, you just saw Benedetta's talk. She will be also on the panel. I think an amazing, amazing architect. Um, and um, Adam Greenfield, we just uh, heard, uh, will not be on the panel, but give his talk. So let's start with the first um, talk by Teresa about the piano project. <laughs> 
Hi, so I would like to thank uh, the Recite organizers for inviting me to this interdisciplinary um, audience in, in many sense. Um, as you heard, I am a sociologist, and uh, so probably it would be expected that I talk about uh, people. <laughs> but actually, uh, what I would like to propose is to think um, in a more extended way about what the community is. Because, of course, in sociology, and social anthropology and in um, public discourse. Normally, when we talk about community, we think about um, the people, the community of people. But I think it's pretty interesting when we um, think about public spaces and, let's say, public experiments with urban spaces to think in terms of a heterogeneous commun uh, community of human and non-human actors and actually to, to create a space for agency of non-human actors as well as um, the human ones. To do this, um, I will use oh, my, my provocation would be um, an interpretation of a project which by no means is mine. Uh, it's um, a project uh, run by um, Andrzej Kobza, uh, a Prague urban activist that he started um, roughly a year ago. And I think it's an interesting project in which we can think so, some new ideas of how to think about community, forming new communities in, in the city, but also about what uh, we should um, sort of imagine under the word of planning, and that planning does not need to be top-down, but we can rather think about planning in terms of what I would call creating space for emergence of some new surprises and participations in the city. Um, so the project um, I want to talk about is called Pianos in the City. And um, the idea has been to place several pianos um, in the public spaces in Prague and sort of to see what people do or do not do with them, what new people, materials, communities would be created by this object uh, being placed in the public space. Uh, the initiator of this project, Andrei Kobza, as I said, he, he declares the, his aim was to vitalize and inspirate the public space by placing of these objects um, to the city. Um, it created rather, I think, interesting uh, participation and interests of inhabitants of the city, also um, of the media and different types of communities of people, materials, but as you will see, also other musical ex uh, instruments, for example, have been forming around these, um, what I would call, participatory objects being placed um, into the public space. Some of them, of course, were more temporary. For example, when uh, you know somebody starts to play in a, on the piano and you know, people start to um, stop at the place and, uh, you know, maybe start dance or they bring some of their other music instruments and join them. But also, um, it, it started to create more permanent sort of uh, communities when, for example, people started to care for the piano um, because it's vulnerable to, to you know, weather conditions, or they started also to initiate placement of pianos in different towns in the Czech Republic when they you know, heard how, um, how this works um, 
in Prague. And now uh, Andrzej Kobza is, um, is thinking about uh, or is planning to to install other types of objects to the public spaces in the Prague, such as grills or chess, um, chess tables uh, for people again to sort of uh, start some participatory uh, bottom-up activities around, around these objects and with these objects. Um, what I think it's, is interesting about this project or what we can learn um, more generally about um, about this urban experiment, even though I don't think we can uh, easily generalize from that, by, but I think it's not idiosyncratic for this project. Is that first, um, it's a concrete material object that is in the center of, of the happening. It has no rigid script or rules with which it is placed um, into the public space. So it's not simply uh, what we would perceive as um, you know, planning either top-down or bottom-up, so that there is some script according to which uh, the object should be uh, necessarily used. So it invites creativity and participation from people. The, the rather, I would say, um, strong response it, um, it created um, with inhabitants of Prague uh, was an effect of, of the fact that um, it appeals to skills that are rather widely distributed in the population, which is playing uh, piano on some level, but also um, it opens up space for other types of um, active participation in relation to the objects and communities uh, created around, um, around the object. The other interesting, I think, um, feature of the project is, as I mentioned, the piano is vulnerable. It's an object in the public space, and of course, it makes the project risky, but also it invites care and it sh sort of uh, showcases or embodies the idea that the public spaces, they are not here uh, to be taken for granted, but we have to take care for, uh, for them. And it creates potential for surprise. For example, there, I, yeah, I'm com coming to the close. Um, uh, there has been very popular video when uh, a homeless person comes to the piano and he starts playing beautifully uh, Vltava, you know, one of the quite famous pieces um, of Czech music. And it, it you know, it's, it's sort of uh, shocking some stereotypes we may have about homeless people. So this is, I think, the, the positive or interesting features we can learn from this. Uh, to, to come to close, I also think there are, of course, some limits um, to this project. And mainly it is that when we talk about uh, a city for all, uh, or when we think um, this project as a sort of model project for participation, it suggests that finally everything can be included and i believe everything cannot be included everyone cannot be included in the same time space and of course politics is as much about inclusion about uh, as about exclusion and we so we also we need to be ready to fight okay yeah. we need to move on i need to be harsh here sure and uh, then we discuss it later niomba lomba Niombo Lomba will now uh, talk about her work in Stuttgart. Um, so first, thank you very much for having me here on the conference. It's quite interesting because I have completely different experience and different background than most of you. Uh, we are quite diverse here, but I'm not a city planner. Um, I am a city councillor and I also work, work for the government of the uh, region of Baden-Württemberg, which um, 
Florian also already mentioned, uh, and this is somehow important. I want to, starting, I want to give you a little bit of the setting um, of the region that I'm living in. Um, the point was actually that uh, we had uh, a debate on a huge project, which is called Stuttgart 21, which, which is a project of a central station. And I'm not going to talk about that project here, but um, the project had an impact on uh, the pol political landscape in uh, Baden-Württemberg and in Stuttgart, because there were many people that were really not happy with the way politics was done in the region and in the city, and they wanted to have more transparency, they want to have more participation, and they wanted to be more engaged um, within political process. And that's the setting where the new elected government and also the Lord Mayor of Stuttgart and um, the, the, the the elected parties in the city council started working. So um, the setting is also that we have a prime minister, a green prime minister, who is really engaged in balancing the start market and society within democracy. Um, Michael Kimmelman already yesterday mentioned Hannah Arendt, and that's sort of the leading figure of the prime minister. So I don't, I, I just want to give you the setting because um, this is really, this is sort of uh, important. So the main idea um, of the, uh, of, of changing something is about bringing people together and offering an exchange at eye level, as well as uh, a policy of listening. And now I have a picture which seems quite confusing, but which shows the, uh, the sort of the, 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 the situation we are facing, because we are trying to change democracy, but we we don't want to change the representative system, but we want to bring in more civic participation and direct democracy into the system, um, into parliaments and the councils, and into the administration. So we're working on new roles for everyone, new roles for the parties, for uh, association and lobbies, for citizen groups, for experts, consultants, lobbyists, for voiceless citizens, for um, we, we are working with representative samples in participation processes. So this is really a cultural change and honestly we are just at the beginning and maybe it will take another 10, 20 years really to change something and if you're at the beginning of something you don't know where you're going to end up and this is also frightening for people and we know that but we still think that we should at least try to work on it. So. Um, as you can see, there is the civic participation which we want to bring up, and we have the direct democracy. This is important to us because we have we experience that people always think if they are uh, if they can participate that they also can decide. But participation doesn't mean decision; it just means uh, talking to each other, consulting, etc. And direct democracy is a decision. So. Um, that's why we um, make it, we, we distinguish the both of them. So concerning civic participation, we have sort of certain rules um, or certain ideas that we follow um, in theory. As I told you, we are working on implementing it, so uh, it's not in every process so far, also not within the city, but it starts more and more. And we try to start as soon as possible with participation processes so that we don't start if a project is already completely uh, uh, um, uh, thought through by whomever is in charge, but um, so that we can it, it take into account of what the people in the region, in the area concerned um, think. And we also go for informal uh, participation because in Germany there is participation which is in the planning process, which is formal, which is foreseen already. So you have hearings, which you have also in other countries. You know it, you have hearings yourself. So that's one thing what we're doing, and we, we're trying to bring transparency into the process and reali uh, reliability, flexibility. That's important because if you do participation, you never know um, where it's going to lead you. So what you have to be is you have to be open-minded for possible different solutions. If you're not, then don't do participation. You know, because I mean, that's fake, then it's fake. And don't disappoint people. And that's also a thing, if you're planning th things, you have to be aware of what, um, what uh, variation is possible in the project. So don't tell them th something you cannot stick to. 
Um, and then, of course, we have to include um, minorities. I want to say something to direct democracy, democracy. You know it. It's an addition to representative democracy. And by the way, it can help you if you have a decision done by the people directly for a certain process because you know that they are, now it's clear that they're in favor or against it. It replaces the parliament uh, decision for a single question, but not for any question. But it can be in a process quite helpful if you have a decision done directly by the people. So another thing that is important to me is the balance between majority and minority. I just say this because you mentioned the question of how to imp implement um, people that are, let's say, speechless or that don't have someone. So we have um, the majority in elections, but the uh, participation enables you to bring in these positions into a dialogue. So it is a, important to have a balance. That's at least our uh, imp uh, attitude. So I will just give you a few examples on uh, what we are doing. We have, of course, like um, many other municipalities, having a participatory budgeting. Online budgeting, we have uh, every second year we have um, budget debates, so it's every second year. We are optimizing it from year to year. I just wanted, I took it as an example because I had a discussion with friends of mine here in Czech Republic telling me, yeah, you know, I mean, but um, uh, we are in the middle of change uh, of a society, so we, we are not as far as you are, so um, we cannot implement it. But remember, the first participatory budgeting was in Brazil you know, in Porto Alegre in 1989, after they left democracy, and they implemented it, it because of promotion of democracy, equity, meaning distributive justice, and good governance. So it can be very helpful to already the beginning of a new democracy to implement such tools. So um, the, the second thing that I wanted to just mention quickly is that we had a dialogue within the city of Stuttgart which actually dealt with a cultural guidance for the city, which is an open participatory process over almost two years. And there was a working group on the question of space and planning. And what the people came up with is really important, I guess, to us. Um, it's um, that they say to us, to the public, it is important. Uh, it has an importance uh, that we plan public space and, and that we are involved in planning and that we have a disciplinary approach and that we think about the gateways of urban, uh, urbanity, culture, creativity and space and that we have free spaces of experiments, that's what we heard yesterday already, that we need free spaces and that we have a spatial development with the citizens. So that's what, what the citizens claimed. Think, if you're planning something, think about us, talk to us. And the uh, next thing is a little process which is completely different. We're having a place in the city which is a beautiful park and a beautiful villa, as you can see. And is, it is not in public hand. It has been 80, 80 years ago, and it was bought by a, a German um, by a German TV channel. And now um, there is a debate going on that uh, we, the public wants, it, wants the area back. And the city also has already decided to rebuy it. Of course, it is in private hand and it's quite difficult. So there was a group that, uh, uh, that started working on, they called themselves Occupy Villa Back. I was part of it, not as a city council, but as a private person. And uh, because I'm a citizen as well, I'm not only a city councillor. And what we did is, we, we occupied the place with participatory processes. So we did participatory processes over the summer and tried to engage the people with, um, but the area around the villa is very diverse. We have 50% uh, people of migration background over there. So um, just to let you know, we also support bottom to top processes. So that's it and thank you for your attention. Wow, you see. Okay, guys. Hello, hello. Hello, everybody. 11 years ago, uh, we started to look for a piece of land in Berlin. We were looking for a piece like a garden, and we found a beautiful place in the middle of the city, five minutes from the middle, actually. And uh, we built a little shack, and we live in trailers. And every weekend, we invite our friends to dance. We done this every weekend 
in the beginning with 100 people, then with 200 people, and then suddenly this place getting really famous, and we shared it with a lot of young people. Sometimes we have more than 1,000 people on the weekend. They had fun with us, and uh, we danced a lot. <laughs> suddenly, uh, we said, okay, what else we need? We need uh, also good food, healthy food. We need more garden, we need a theater, we need a little spa. So everything what we've done, we build it with our community together, out of wood, self-made, and we're getting more famous and more famous. In the end, we had more than 100,000 visitors. In, in a year, we built a half pipe, we have soccer plays, we built basketball, we had a theater group, we have little shacks we rent for like a hotel. And suddenly in this moment, the city said, we don't need this anymore, we need more office spaces. This was the plan of the city. It was 18,000 square meter of office places and our community said why we want that. And this was not the only place, the whole riversides were planned for the new main German city, the new Berlin, all medias of Germany coming there. And so suddenly, we brought together with uh, left-wing activists, many, many people on the street. More than 10,000 people getting on the street with us together to be against this huge planning. And suddenly, we actually convinced all the parties that this is important also for a city where people can hang out, where people come together, where we are thinking the new cities with one kid families or maybe single families, they need public or half public spaces to come together. These are the new living rooms of families. So the, the people of a city are actually also a kind of family when they come together, when they have meeting points. So this is why we were very strong and we were fighting, but the city in the end didn't help us. But we found a Swiss pension fund who brought the land for us. And this will Mario now explain a little bit more. Uh, actually, uh, I don't think that the city has a plan for developing this because why the city this, this land belonged to a public company. Uh, they were forced, because Berlin is known as a city poor but sexy, and they don't have money, and that's why they are selling the land, the public land. So to sell the land for the highest price, you need the right to build something like this. 80,000 square meters, because you calculate the land, not because of the size, but the right to build. So the city decided they forced the public companies to sell the land based on this plants. So in Berlin, I don't know, you know better, there are office spaces, plenty of office spaces, there are buildings empty, no, no, no one need any more office space. It's just a matter of calculation to get the highest price on public land. And then the citizen referendum was about should we build office space nobody needs or should we just leave the land as it is? To, to, to have the river, and as you've seen, the river publicly accessible at least, because this is not public anymore. Unfortunately, in Germany, it's different to Switzerland, a public referendum is not binding anyone in, in, in Germany. And that's why we had to answer the question, how can we preserve this land mm. for creativity? Because there are many people bidding for this land, and they speculated, come on, we're going to buy this land and we build there some hostels, some luxury apartments, whatever they, they planned. Uh, for us, the decision was, first what we have to do is we have to participate in this public process. And actually, we bid for this land. We offered the highest price to, to take this land off the market. And this is the secret. What we are talking about is not building something, just taking land off the market, nothing else. So we don't calculate what you can build on this. What we just did is we sit together and we started to, with a civic association, 
So we started to plant trees. We took over the land and we, we planted trees. And we, we gave it back to the, to the public, actually. We bought the land, we sell beer, we sell steaks, we sell tickets for dancing, but we don't build anything. We didn't start to build anything. We gave it back to the, uh, to the public and we start working uh, with the people and to give them a reason not to fight against plans to build office spaces, but to fight for something, for something very concrete. And what you see here is a model, what we, what we, were, what we were doing. We created a model, how could an urban city quarter could look like. And so finally, we found out that this is not about us, it's not about dancing, it's not about a bar, it's not about a theater, it's about a neighborhood. Because what you see in the middle of nowhere in Berlin, in the middle of, of the city actually, there was the wall. You couldn't buy a coffee, fresh food, bread. It was not available there, it was abandoned. So and nobody cared of the investors and we invited all the investors. How would you organize to get fresh food? bread and all this, and that's why we thought we are not building a new bar 25. We are developing a city quarter and we have to take care of the neighborhood, actually. So, and that's why we created a village. We said, okay, everything you need to have a community, we have to build there. So we didn't decide we need a bakery. It's needed, it's obvious what you need to live together and to have a community. So, and actually, first the people, then the concept, and then address politics, investors, and all the other people. Because we didn't ask for a single penny first. We didn't ask, we offered. We gave a concept, we, get a, we had the, the highest bid, and we just said, are you willing to pay the money for this land? And then a Swiss, pen, Swiss pension fund said, yes, you have the people, you have the capacity, we're going to buy this land and give it to you as a leasehold. And then we split it into reasonable units. And then we said, okay, there's the village, there's the hotel, there is going to be the technology center. So, and then you have a balance of economics, let's put it this way. Uh, but finally, when you have the land, you need the right funds to build something there. And then again, we didn't ask for money. We, we gathered people who invested money for just one promise. It's not a gift. You will get your money back, nothing else. You won't get profit, you won't lose money, but you give your money for something good, and this is what we can promise to you. And how much money you invest, is, doesn't, it doesn't matter. You have one vote as a person but not as an investor. One more minute. And actually, one minute left. You can read all this in the internet. These are our rules. We, we founded a cooperative. And uh, so we are under strict regulations. So we are under control, we are transparent. Everyone can see, yes, and this is something very important, what you just mentioned. Give a promise and stick to it. And give the proof that you stick to the rules. And actually, this is uh, how it works with us. We got the land and we have only three criteria. You cannot buy any space at our Holzmarkt. You just have to apply with the concept. Regardless how much money you have, you have to apply with the concept. And the concept has to work, it has to be convincing, it has to be exciting. Second, you have to prove that you contribute something to your neighbors. If you want to have a silent room, you're not at the right place. And finally, you have to pay the rent. We have to cover the cost because this is the uh, condition for being creative and free, not to be dependent on public money or on some funds from someone else. So we paid everything, what you see here, we paid on our own. Maybe, maybe we can leave the last, can you leave the last one? Okay. Thank you. Now I would like to get Andre and Benedetta to, to join us. So, Andre, 
look, it's only three, three things you need to do to um, develop an area. Um, this is a very alternative idea. This is 18,000 square meter. It's pretty big. Um, but the one core idea is uh, that you could, if you want to develop something else, uh, you have to change your attitude towards the thing, towards the land. Um, what do you think about that concept? Now looking at 500 uh, hectares. Uh, excellent example. Uh, first of all, I'm not a developer anymore. I'm former developer. Now me and my team, we named uh, each other as a visionary, visionaries. Uh, and our project <coughs> uh, consists from two, two, big, two big parts. The first part is uh, usual developing. And the second part is how create or how uh, modeling life in these spaces. And we put attention on the first floors, on ground floors, and we want to have people on the streets use, uh, use uh, bikes or food and live in this uh, small uh, piece of land, piece of part of Moscow. But would you be able in Moscow to ask a developer with a similar question, you say, okay, you, you get a piece of land, it's no problem, um, but you need to first show us a concept. Uh, second of all, you have to contribute to the common ground, like public space, and uh, uh, of course you need to cover the cost. Would, would that be a model that you could ask? Like a similar idea that uh, a city is, uh, that you have to give more than just um, saying, I'm doing a project here. Look, we live in absolutely different worlds. <laughs> I know, I know, but I, I, I'm... <laughs> and what is possible in Berlin, it's impossible in Moscow. Uh, uh, our goal is to convince our government that to, to make this project for creative people and to let them uh, start their businesses and grow up, it's good. And we did this. And our... Uh, conditions uh, in which we are exist, it's absolutely different. What guys uh, did in Berlin, it's great, it's super. And uh, next time when, I am, uh, when uh, I, I am in Berlin, I definitely go and dance with you. Uh, <laughs> 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 ask, me, ask me an easier question, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. I would like to ask you a question. Um, as you just saw uh, in politics, it becomes more and more complex to make a decision. It seems like uh, uh, people want to take part, but then there's a huge step to decision. Um, if you would now, under this condition, do your project in Barcelona with, with the market again, where you take away lots of houses, uh, there has been the crisis, people are pretty aware. Do you think you could still do this kind of um, architecture? Uh, in a way, uh, the, the process, as she was explaining, it was very interesting to me, you know, because I, I'm, not, I'm not a politician and I'm not understanding how this decision-making is working. But it, it was trying to, to put the participation into the process no so it's a, it's a, it's it's very interesting very very good but in a way in barcelona there was a kind of a way of working where the process was kind of easy and kind of direct uh, and also we had a lot of conversations with people and there was the association of the of the people selling and the neighbors and everybody was involved. So in a way it was not so um, easy to describe, but it was a par participative process, uh, very, very clearly. Right, because when, when you were asked 
um, before, how the process worked, you didn't mention the people, you mentioned the government, and so I was thinking maybe at that time, people wouldn't want to be part in this, or they kind of wanted to see what happens. Um, but as an architect, would you, as an architect like you, where uh, form is not always easy for people to, to accept, uh, are you scared of the idea that um, more and more people will tell you yes and no and, well, can we be part? Yeah. No. In a way, I was never scared. I, 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 I realized we had, <laughs> no, we had a lot of conversations with people. And, and in a way, it depends on how you have the conversation. And, and people is very open. Sometimes they are even demanding because they, they would like a fantastic result. So they give a lot of, of uh, trust on, on the architect as the one who decides uh, the final shape. But in order to, to have a, a good result. In Santa Caterina was very complex. It was uh, more than 10 years of process. So if you have to tell piece by piece, uh, it would have been very complex. Well, in, I mean, in Berlin, my experience is that these processes are becoming very public and to make decisions becomes more and more complicated. And there's a discussion, are we as architects more like moderators of worlds or are we still um, also uh, uh, space maker, form maker, um, decision maker. So, mm -hmm. um, I would, because w my interest in this discussion is not so much about diversity as such, we all know it, but how to make it, how to make diversity. And, and Yombo, I would like to know, um, uh, my experience as an architect is the, the distance between the legislation and me as a practicing person, being really active, very flexible, is sometimes huge. In Berlin, it's a big problem. Um, how, do you, how do you face uh, the, the question to make this apparatus uh, that is the government to, to start to also be a bit more dancing? Oh, you, you okay, sorry. So th that's um, a very challenging question, and this actually belongs more to what I'm doing in my professional life, less what I'm doing in the city council. Um, as I told you, we're trying to change the culture in the way that administration and policies work, and uh, which means uh, we, we implemented in, in, in the further education of um, at the administration there for Baden-Württemberg, there is now an implementation of compulsory uh, participation. So they have to learn how to how to do and run participatory processes, but also how to communicate differently. And uh, we are working together with uh, industry in that case. So um, also, for example, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have associations of engineers that are mostly in charge of infrastructural projects. They also, together with us, start uh, to change the way the people are educated. Also at the universities in Baden-Württemberg, it, uh, it, it, it got entry in the curriculums of the people. So okay. we're taking care that we not only say, OK, you have to do that, but also that you learn how to do it. And anyways, administration has to change because we have new ways of managing processes. So it's a process for everyone and that's why I meant it's, it's at the beginning. And just to, to, to let me make one remark, it's, it's a general change in the administration. We need more women. By the way, we didn't have so much women on that panel of uh, all of the okay. conference. So, um, yeah. and, and, and we know that women are, for example, uh, communicating differently also, if, uh, and usually the participatory processes are run by the ones that are in charge for the projects, not as much by the administration itself. So it is indeed a change uh, in education as well. Okay, um, it's interesting because uh, as we do these projects in Berlin with many clients, we have sometimes 30 clients for one building, we, we made a course called um, Group Dynamics. For a whole weekend, we learned how to work with group dynamics, which I didn't expect as an architect to learn. So when I come to your project, this is a complete group dynamic. And as I uh, heard, you, you're juggling with uh, 60 million euros uh, and more, I guess. Um, 
when you did bar 25, this was a sort of scale one could think of. Uh, how, how do you deal with group dynamics in the idea of diversity? First of all, you have to make different groups and different things have to be desired from different groups and different people. I think the most important thing is that the people can be a part of it, but what is their need? You ask her, it's difficult for an architect to make a house nice when everybody talks with it, but I think it is, the most need is how is the insight, how, how, how is what I can do there, how I can bring myself into a project, but definitely financial facts. You don't can discuss with 500 people or 1,000. This is not possible. You have to make before the rules how it works. Yes, it's, it's true, but uh, the point is define group. Define the people you have to participate to, to, to talk to. You have to talk to politicians never expect any answer from a politician. This is, the first, uh, this is the first rule. So, and that's why we don't go to the politicians and, and ask them. We just say, this is what we want to do. At least we ask you, don't, don't stop it, don't block it. Just think of how to make it possible. If there is a political will and we had decision, you know, no, not a single party, not the left or the right or the middle or the liberal or whatever, was against the project. And this is first step of participation. So we convinced them. Finally, the administration was forced by the politics, uh, rather think, make it happen. And you have to bypass certain rules because the rules are not made to block something, but to take care of security and whatever sound noise protection, whatever, whatever it is. And then you have to, what, what you all just mentioned, if you want to participate the, uh, the citizen, you have, to, you have to form something very concrete. You have to give them a vote. You do, don't have to ask them. You have to offer them a vote. And they are in our cooperative with the vote. And they have the, single vote, the, the same vote and the same rights as the investors. And of course, you have to talk to the investors. But if you promised, if you talk to the investors, you don't talk to them, oh, we should plant a tree there or there. You just have to tell them, your money is not a gift, you will get it back, and this is the interest rate. Full okay. stop. So, um, that's oh. it. And, and the citizens, they talk, okay, we would like to have a tree there. Is that possible? And then there have to be a parliament to say, yeah, this is possible. You should not be afraid to exclude people from a discussion. Don't ask everyone for an answer. Just say, you are an investor, you give me money. This is something, you know, this is what I offer you, nothing else. So somebody who gives us money has not the right to plant a tree. He has the right to get interest rate on that. Okay, we, that, that is a very interesting uh, point that uh, we, we had a project, the Tempelhofer Feld is a huge issue in Berlin. We had this old airport that is now open and there was a huge, the big idea of participation and we would all together decide uh, what to do with it and suddenly there was a plan. And everyone thought, I haven't discussed this plan. And then people got angry and they stopped it now. So uh, the moment money comes in to the project, uh, and that's something uh, I want to ask you, Andre, you have a huge pressure to develop. So how, how do you withstand this pressure? Because you said you're really interested in the ground floor zone and in the public space. That's something you put a lot of pressure on. So you tell the, inv the investors, you can build something if you take care of the public space, the activity there, small businesses, large businesses. Uh, is this something you, you, you can get through? Is this, how, how will you do that? How will you make sure this will happen? <coughs> Moscow is a big city on the one, on the, on the one hand, but from, uh, on the other hand, uh, there, is, there are no uh, uh, very many unique projects. And Arco Artao is a very unique project. And this project has his adventure against others. 
and one of them is that we create these uh, uh, ground floors. We create possibility for creative people to start, and it means that uh, uh, we have very active street life, and street life brings money. And when money comes, it means that investors will have market up. And f uh, after that, to talk with investors is very easy. It's very simple with uh, your, uh, my colleague already uh, said. It's very easy. Just give me, give me your money. This is the rules. You will, be be you will have uh, at the end of the way you will have this IRA or NPV, uh, this profit, that's it. If you don't want, go another and find another project with big IRA, but it's not so easy. With investors, with money, it's not so difficult to, to, to talk. Okay. <laughs> um, w would you agree that um, if you would now get this offer as an architect um, and you kind of have this adventure to make a ground floor so lively that the investors will accept that the rest will work, w would you agree that as a, as a programmatic model f for diversity, would you, would you, what would you do? I would like to see, for example, how people usually move, uh, the desires, <coughs> the uh, way of acting, and these things are, are very interesting. Uh, for example, yes. uh, in the last years when we are doing a competition or a new project, we, we always work with uh, people of other fields, you know, uh, sociologists, uh, photographers, uh, geographer, and, and they, they give other ideas, and especially good sociologists, he can be fantastic in explaining how people uh, usually react, no? this reaction that you, uh, you don't, you don't uh, know, you don't know, it's not written in a plan, but, but if you know about them, then it's easier to understand what is the limit between a space which is a public space and a private one and, and what is in between and how you can make this between work and which kind of equilibrium you need. You know, because also if you have a kind of a open space, it's not so easy to make it work or to make it uh, sustainable under the economical point of view, you, you need to have this kind of equilibrium between the activity and how the activity goes on. So I think this, this equilibrium is what's, uh, what's interesting to me. No? Yeah. <laughs> and, and your experiment is fantastic also because you're approaching this equilibrium as if you are a kind of uh, the owner of a big place and, and you have to try to make it working in the best way, you know? so, and, but, but in the same time to make it sustainable. So it's, uh, it's working with small things. <laughs> small things <laughs> is, is my jump to Teresa's project. Um, where, was, there a reason, was there a need to do this project? Was there a sort of lack of something in the public spaces you showed to, to say, we just do this not only because it's a really fantastic project to put a piano in a place, a very <laughs> private, very fragile object into the, the realm of the public, or is it also, was there a question? I think the interesting thing is that uh, the placement of the piano, it sort of helped to articulate some lack of something, right? A lack of um, places for creativity in the shared urban space that we might not know about before. Uh, and I think th this is interesting about um, this project that, you know, the object itself, it helped the people to articulate some needs of sharing emotions through music, for example, in in the well public space. Actually, I I don't think we or sometimes I think that the very notion of public space is also a little bit dangerous because. Um, for example, when you think about uh, some excluded people like 
homeless people or when, when you see how they uh, use the, or they would like to need to use the urban space, it's much more for them to create some sort of private spaces in the urban space. And very often the notion of public space is used by the municipality as a tool to um, draw them out of the space, like for example in Petrin Prague, in um, uh, in Petrin Park in Prague, where in fact by um, uh, banning sort of private activities in the space, you exclude uh, some groups of people that may not have resources to participate in the space as a public space. So I, I am sort of, even though it's, um, it's very common to, to see the concept of public space as something, you know, that, that's the obvious common good, not necessarily. Uh, and of course, we know you mentioned Hanach Ar and that the, the tradition of, of the, the very idea of the public, it's a middle class idea, it's bourgeois, um, you know, uh, society concept. So we also, I think, need to think critically about uh, the very concept of public space. I think maybe in the whole smart project, you, you're working on this kind of uh, hybrid idea of privacy and public. Um, uh, I just followed up the process of getting a building permission and the problem they had was that they didn't want to tell how it will look. And of course the, the city said, well we can only give you a permission on something we know how it looks. And now they learned that maybe uh, um, the, the project could be uh, a process project. Uh, what is your interest in this idea of uh, the, the place to become? It's not finished, it's kind of becoming. And what is your interest between the sort of privacy of the projects and the public? It's very interesting to talk to the administration because finally, after a year of discussion, they told us, rather tell us what you not want to do. Because we don't understand what you what you not want. what your plan uh -huh. is. Because uh, what uh, what the the temporary use it's 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 an economic need, I think. Because um, you know my kids are grown up, they left the house. But for my house, I have to pay 30 more years, and you're gonna build a house to finance it for 50 years or whatever, you know. And what we are doing temporary use, you have to be able, willing and you could, should finance it, to tear it down next year. So we built a temporary club and you have to finance and to build it for a temporary use. And that's something an administration cannot... They just said, what, you build a theater out of old windows? I, I don't understand. Tell us. You don't make a concert there with uh, electronic or with... What is this? Trumpets. There? With trumpets. Okay, <coughs> we sign it. You don't make open fire there. Yes, we sign, we don't make open fire. So the point is, uh, if you want to let creativity grow, don't ask the people, tell me exactly what you plan. Just give a frame, give, give certain rules. And of course, we have to care for the neighbors and we cannot play loud music after midnight. It's for sure. And that's why we built a very innovative club Suddenly, we thought we need some sound protection, and that's why we built a club out of wood, house and house. And then we didn't have time. We wanted to open in May, and they said, to dry the concrete, it takes six weeks. But why don't you do it out of wood? So we have a club built out of wood with a perfect sound protection. We can have 110 decibel inside, and you can, you can put your, your child sleeping in front of the club. So you can <coughs> For us, it's important what we learned in the last 11 years in a very small thing. That we actually just built a wooden shack with old wood. We had two cases of beer and we start to build this little house. But then suddenly people come to us and they said, yeah, I have this idea. I want to build a little circus. I want to make a theater. So we said, oh, this is a good idea. We have a little space. So how do you want to do it? Like, like this. We said, okay, good. 
you come here with your friends and you can build. Your work is not paid, but then you have your fiat where you can work with your fiat group. And suddenly some beautiful buildings get made out of a group of friends and this group of friends actually enjoying the whole community. And this is how it was growing in the last 11 years. Not now we try to do is the same, but in a regular thing with uh, regular buildings together with the administration. And this actually is something really mostly impossible. But we talked a lot and now we get on the way. And so we do it for piece for piece. And maybe there are new people coming with new ideas and we don't know actually what will be on this quarter. Well, Andre, uh, I talked to him before. Um, you made this in this art, uh, art quartal, this 500 hectare space. Uh, there's already some amazing stuff that started. Uh, it's, uh, there are a lot of industri industrial buildings as well, and I think you started already with one really amazing project there. Um, but it's, uh, we discussed how long do you need for a building permission, and uh, it's kind of between uh, one and five years. So looking at this five by one kilometer project, um, <laughs> Uh, with, I think, over 100 private owners in it. Um, w w can you see a whole idea in there? Or is this possible that you see as, as maybe um, with the whole smart project is more like an idea of a concept and here's more like an idea of how to develop, uh, also financially. Do you, can you see a city coming from, from that condition? Can I see what? Can you see the city that, that you're thinking of coming from the conditions you, you, you explained to me? You mean uh, authorities? Uh, well, that and all the different owners and, and the pure, pure size of it. So the main idea of, pro of Art Quartal project is to show that this, to realize this project is uh, profitable for all uh, who will particip participate in this. City, investors, owners, clients, people, uh, cre uh, cre uh, uh, creative class for everybody. So we made a concept. We do it with an international team, more than 30 people. Uh, uh, under the, uh, inside this concept, we uh, made an economic model which shows that it's interesting for all these uh, parts of our life. And now we step by step start to realize it. And is there a discussion going on within the people living in uh, Moscow about this project? And is there a sort of, do, do you have discussions or how, how is it received? You mean residentials or just people who live? who live in like the, the in this in this area in, in the area or in, in Moscow so it, <laughs> uh, we discuss we will discuss uh, it's our one of our line to realize this project of course to be uh, in uh, connected to these people and uh, of course uh, <laughs> Some of them are happy, some of them are unhappy. It's usual thing. Uh, just don't focus on these who are not too unhappy. So we have to get Nyomba over to Moscow. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> and, oh, sorry, we have to do this. I would love to come. I've never been there. And you know we have even delegation coming from China to us. So we, you invited to come to Stuttgart as well to exchange. I saw someone in the public. Maybe we could open up for the public. Well, we, uh, we, yeah. I look at my watch. It says 37 seconds left oh, for our okay. conversation. Uh, before we go into the public, anything? We, we, anything? Or I, yeah, I mean, if, I, I really think it is interesting talk, to talk about the question of um, 
public space and interim or uh, temporarily um, uh, available space, not as someone who's doing participation, but we experience that, that as well in the city. And we are living in a city where we don't have space. We, need, we are relying on temporary available space. And what we experience is the administration now is open for that more and more, you know? But now, if, you ha if you're running a project and it is successful, then the people are really, uh, they, they, they are not happy if you tell them, okay, it's three years, are done now, we're sorry, we said we, it's running for three years, we have to close it, and then the people are, are unhappy with that. So we opened up, so say, the box of the Pandora, because we, we have uh, positive projects, but we have to close them. Although we, all, we always said it, we always mentioned it, so there is something which is also difficult to that issue of temporary space. Then, then I should open the box of Pandora now. Um, Actually, uh, I would like to pose the first question. Uh, being organizer, I stopped asking the question, but this was, I think, the best panel so far, the most usable for the city of Prague. And I want to thank you for telling us that uh, if you have a concept and business plan, you can develop the city even if you are not a developer. You can be NGO or consortium or anything. That's what you, you said. Also, I really much appreciate that you have to stick to a promise to not just uh, give false hopes to, to public. So you have a responsibility for them. This is moral value that we have to accept. And uh, last note, not, not last note, but I really wrote down, uh, you have to be prepared for new solution. If you are not, then don't do participation and disappoint people. So what I'm, actually my personal experience past two years with city of Prague, Bratislava, and some other Central European city, there is this general mantra of participation. Everybody welcomes it, but people don't know how to do it. I mean, how you actually do participation, what is the format, how you design the process. And Nyombo, I really like the chart, like you say, there are new roles for everyone. So the city of Stuttgart seems to be methodologically more prepared and advanced for this. So the question is actually who designed this process and uh, how long is this plan for, as you said, three years are not enough possibly. And uh, one thing that I see even on Institute of uh, Prague development is that young people full of enthusiasm they go into the process they go face the system and in three years they are like trained out and what you said it was extremely important is administration has to like be forced to change so how did you change administration in your city in order this participation will be much more easier I apologize to many questions but this is just mind-blowing you, no, you have to. Okay, I, I, I wasn't sure whether we're collecting or... Oh my God, um, I was talking to someone yesterday night and we, we came up to the conclusion that probably we should do our own conference on participation because these are so many questions that I cannot answer in, you know, like half a minute. Um, at first, uh, the city, you have to understand that there was so much pressure within the city and they were uh, very engaged people also in the administration by the way they are not all stubborn whatever they are very there are people in the administration that are are very open minded but they need to have the political support that they are allowed to do participation you know they are not completely idiots sorry but if they're very they they are partly they are very up much into the debate because they follow uh, the, the researchers and so on and so forth and they, they, they discuss with the NGOs. So uh, you have to, uh, it, it's, it's partly it, it functions like that. There are some parts where we say, okay, we ha have new projects starting and then we go for it. And now what we <coughs> also have, um, we are working on guidelines on participations. There are some cities in, in Germany that already have guidelines, but honestly, it's important to have the process with the administration, politics, and society to, to develop an understanding, but for sure that's not enough. If you have it written on paper, it doesn't say something. So, in general, what we do is, at the beginning of a process, um, plan to, to, to have like a... In Germany, for, for the environment, you know the, the, the word of the scoping that at the beginning of a process, you have to do like a analysis, a st stakeholder analysis. And then you take the people together that you analyze that are somehow um, uh, part, uh, important to the process or they are somehow um, 
um, uh, uh, targeted by the process. So you, you look at it and then you put the people together. That's ideal, you know, that's so. And you put it, them together for a little conference and then you tell them, okay, um, we are having that project. So what do you think? How could we do the participatory process? And there are like two, there is a foundation, Bertelsmann Foundation in Germany that lo was looking at participatory processes and they made a sort of schedule and they said there are 230 different ways of participatory processes. So that's why I said it's, it's you have to be flexible. Sorry, I could tell you more, but well, I have to stop it's, now. It's a pretty unfair question because you kind of need two days to answer it. But uh, I think there, there are more questions. Uh, participation, finally, thank you. Uh, my name is Pavel Borecki and I'm a social scientist and uh, I'd like to bring your attention to the Prague. Uh, nowadays there's a, there's a great process going on uh, in terms of a new strategic plan and there are so many bright minds involved and uh, there's so much happening and it's, it's just amazing to, to, be, to be at that time in Prague and, and seeing it. But there's one single but. Uh, as far as I know, there, there were no like round tables or open sessions for general public. So uh, I'd like to ask Ms. Ms. Nyon Bolomba, uh, how do you think how it can influence the process of approval, the final plan, uh, final strategic plan by politicians? And that there's a sub question, how can influence the realization of the, the plan in the future? If, if there are no run tables, like a campaign, big campaign, if it's not the issue of the whole city. Thank you. You keep it. Uh, I, I have to memorize. At first, I mean, um, if you do a process, you have to always take into account that everybody is somehow um, has a place in that process. So if you're doing the process and you leave the politicians aside, you won't take them with you. So they have to at least decide that there is a process going on if it's a city uh, a process run by the city, or they have to be, they have to ask, they have to, and I assure you the, the, the a successful processes is usually if the if the politicians also discuss with the people, you know. So, but, um, uh, concerning on success, it depends on what you want. So, um, uh, success is pretty easy to 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 whatever to um, measure, and uh, for one can be successful if if the the, the project is built, for example. For another one, it can be a success if the project has been changed uh, in, in certain ways. Maybe there's another access for blind people, for whatever, handicapped people, or, and so forth. So I'd say um, if you have a good climate and you have sort of an acceptance in the surrounding, then maybe that's a success. So, I, 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 we should talk about the certain issue. You see, you see that that's a little bit difficult. And the other issue was about the what was the second one? I, I don't... Well, <clears throat> I have a feeling that uh, we, we need to make one little step to make it really a general thing, yeah. you know, to get it into the media. Okay, we're preparing a new strategic plan and everyone should be involved. And as far as I know, it, it hasn't happened so far and I'm, I'm curious if it happens in the future. And in that sense, the, the second question was how it can affect the realization of like uh, like real actions which w which would be written in a plan by the experts but not discussed with the general public during the preparation uh, if just people say okay i don't care i will not be i will not uh, participate in 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 any action in realizations of this plan because this is your plan this is not my plan you know that there's no no experience of involvement during so the preparation, uh, so how a, it can inf uh, influence okay. the future of the plan? Th that's a good question, but uh, honestly, uh, it depends on whether the, the people say, I don't care at all. You know, it's a different issue. If the people say, we would have cared, and we're going to oppose it, then you ha will have a problem. But we know cases where the people just say, okay, whatever, you know? So, um, it de uh, we should talk about it later on in the, in the, in the lunch break. Okay. 
Here. Uh, hello. You, you are next. Uh, I'm Terezia Lokšová, urban sociologist, uh, and I have a question for Tereza Šteklova. Uh, I found it very intriguing, as you mentioned, uh, the possible connection between those uh, widely popular uh, public interventions into public space and uh, the possible, of course, inclusion, but also possible exclusions. Could you elaborate a little, bo little bit more on that? Yeah, I think that, <laughs> of course, we, uh, for example, uh, the, the participatory processes, of course, when they are um, sold to the public, and it, it's really important what you said, that uh, the party who is organizing it has to be organizing it with an aim, to be, to be ready to accept the unpredictable outcome of that process. Otherwise, it's, it's killing the trust between um, people and administration. And we, of course, know that this killing of trust is happening on many places. And that really the, the mantra of participation in many places is used instrumentally by those in power to tame um, public resistance. So. You know, it's, it's really important that, the, that uh, the process of participation is um, conducted as an open one, or open-ended one. The other thing is that I think we really need to assume that it's no, not only about involving uh, up to now not heard uh, voices and so on, but really also about excluding uh, some voices that might have been very powerful so far. And, you know, even though there are situations when um, rather diverse visions can coexist in, for example, a city, this coexistence of diversity has some limit. And then I think this, I would say, is the, the really strong politics as well, to have the courage to, exclu to exclude okay. uh, those who might be so far included. So, uh, yeah, uh, on this very general level, I think we, we have to assume that. We, we have one more question, uh, and then, the, yes, please. Yes, I would like to ask the, the Holtzmark people, because it's, it's extremely interesting what you're doing in Berlin. I think that many, many cities in Europe would need a similar thing. That you, of course, know that uh, the, the logics of developers and investors is chasing that kind of activities out of almost every town. Uh, if I have seen it properly, you have asked a, a Swiss pension fund to buy the land for you. And then you said to the Swiss pension fund, this is what we're going to do, you will get your money back. But is it a fact that that Swiss pension fund didn't ask you any guarantee? Of course. So what they was the guarantee? The land. The land. Simple. <laughs> they, are, they own the land. And if we fail, they get the land. And so they have the, the right to build their skyscrapers. So the yeah. land, so our problem is not to give a guarantee, but to protect the project from the investor's interest because every investor is interested to build luxury apartment at the moment at the river. No, so on. Regarding uh, participation, just what we did, we didn't ask and we didn't wait for a process. Don't think that much about a process. Just go into the parliament and ask. Participation is a, it's a dialogue. And if, if, if the people want, if you, ask, if you are not invited, just go there. So, and we, we asked for all the plans and we, you have to do professional work if you want to, if, if you want to realize a dream. You have to work, actually. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't come true and it's not a, no, 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 an I offer by that. the city. I, I understand No, that. no, 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 this is uh, just, uh, just yeah, the answer. We have to Was there not a German fund? Was there not, not a single German institutional the, the, investor the, the, who wanted to the buy the land for you? Convince people, the secret to convince people, you have to understand their interests. If you want to talk to politicians, you have to understand what the interest of the politician is. If you want to force them to do something what they don't want, you fail. And the Swiss pension fund in Switzerland, they have 700 billion euro and they don't know what to do with the money. 
but they have certain rules to invest the money for something good. So go there, have a good concept, and you will get the money. Okay, the question was if there was no German fund. No, no German fund. No, the Germans are too... Uh, I don't know. I don't want to comment on German. Okay, so <laughs> I think um, we answered the fund questions. No German funds, unfortunately. Um, the Swiss are the answer, 7 billion, so you know what to do next. Uh, thank you all very, very much for listening to us. Thank you all very much for uh, listening, uh, uh, talking. And uh, we say goodbye now and see you again. Thank you. Thank you.